Okay, in this video, I'm going to uh, further demonstrate the use of um, um, SPSS to carry out um, HLM uh, with repeated measures data. Um, in this particular demonstration, we have data on uh, about 500 students measured at three time points on um, a number of different variables. The student level identifier uh, is uh, this variable right here, ID. Uh, so this is student one, student two, student three. Um, you know, we each of those students are measured at three time points on a number of variables. The ones we're going to mainly focus in on are going to be math grades measured at time one, two, and three. We also have a time uh, variable here to measure the um, the um, uh, the growth component uh, in terms of change over time in math grades. Um, we're going to incorporate. Um, uh, time variant covariate as well, which is perceived math ability, so me measured at time one, and two, and three. And then we're also going to look at a between uh, student um, uh, variable uh, sex, so basically coded zero for female and one for male. So we're going to run several models. Mainly this is just to kind of illustrate uh, the flexibility of, of the procedures and kind of show you various alternatives that you might uh, consider when running uh, multi-level um, analysis with repeated measures data um, using uh, SPSS and a lot of the same decisions are at play if you're using other programs so at any rate uh, what we're going to do is we're going to start off by modeling variation between students in math grades and so uh, to do this we're going to go to so we're, we'll basically start off with a null model so the first thing we're going to go to analyze go to mixed models and linear um, and I'm going to reset this so I can walk you through. So first step, we're going to move the ID variable over. So this is the level two identifier capturing the different students. We also need a essentially a time, uh, a, a variable that reflects uh, the repeated nature of the data. So we're going to move um, our time variable over here. Um, we also have another variable that would do equally as well, which is the index variable that was formed when I restructured the data set. Uh, but we can leave time over here, and you'll notice that this box highlights, and so uh, this pertains to the issue of how we want to treat the residuals, um, or the, basically the prediction errors at, at uh, level one. Um, so think about it this way, that we essentially are measuring um, um, math grades at three time points and this is going to be our outcome variable so what that translates into is that we will have prediction errors associated with each of the three measurement occasions so that also means then that we'll have um, a variance of those prediction errors as well and so a diagonal matrix just basically means that uh, you know we have uh, variance at time one uh, those residuals at time one variance at time two for those residuals and variance at t time three for those residuals, um, and um, that's and then on the off diagonal, we would not assume any covariance uh, in terms of the residuals over uh, time. So these are the off diagonal uh, elements uh, would all be zero, and so essentially we're assuming that uh, or allowing for the the possibility that the variances in the residuals may vary over time, but we are not assuming that they may co-vary uh, over time. Another, you know, there are a number of other options as well. Uh, unstructured matrix just allows the uh, all uh, resi the residuals um, at each of the t uh, across the time points to vary uh, in terms of their variances and then also all covariances can vary within the um, covariance matrix. Um, other options include um, an AR1 structure where we assume the variances are equal um, over time, uh, and then we also assume an autoregressive structure um, uh, one. Uh, AR1 hetero hetero heterogeneous uh, is assuming that uh, the um, variances are um, heterogeneous, but uh, and but still assuming an AR1 uh, covariance structure. So we're going to stick stick with the diagonal for the time being, and we'll click on continue, and then move our math grades variable over to the dependent box. Um, under random, uh, we can click on, we're going to move ID over to the combinations box, click on include intercept, and uh, the covariance type we can um, 
you know, we can select, um, really we're, we only have one variance that would be estimated in this model and that is the variance of the intercepts across the students. So uh, we'll, you know, we can click on that and then, um, you know, we can also click on something like a diagonal matrix or a scaled identity and basically it's just going to model the, um, the, the variance associated with the um, intercepts um, across the students. So when we click on uh, continue and um, now we can click on uh, estimation. Um, the default in SPSS is uh, restricted maximum likelihood. Uh, this is probably better used when you have uh, smaller data sets. Um, uh, the maximum likelihood is uh, a little bit better when, uh, for the purposes of model comparison. There are various model comparison statistics um, that are really more appropriate for use with maximum likelihood. So I'm going to click on that. Uh, under statistics, I'm going to ask for parameter estimates, uh, covariance pr test for covariance parameters, and covariances of random effects. Click on continue and then on OK. And so right here you'll see uh, in our model dimensions um, table uh, the number of parameters. So we're estimating a grand mean uh, of the intercepts. Um, and so, um, so that's, um, you know, basically that will be the average um, um, uh, math uh, grades uh, score um, computed across uh, the entire sample. So that's uh, the fixed effects. Then we have the random effect which is capturing the variance of the intercepts across individuals. The repeated effects with the diagonal matrix we have three variances of the, of the uh, residuals so we have three parameters being estimated here for a total of five parameters in the model. You'll notice that um, down here when we scroll down you can see uh, the average um, achievement um, across all the students was 73 uh, and then when we look at the estimates of covariance parameters you can see we have the variance um, of the residuals at times 1, 2, and 3. All of those are statistically significant indicating significant variation in the residuals at each of those time points. Uh, and then the variance of the, of the uh, intercept um, across the students is statistically significant. So um, basically we have significant variation at level 1 and level 2 that can be accounted for uh, perhaps by adding in additional predictors. So this is basically a null model and um, you know and, and another possibility too is um, you know we just ran the model where we incorporated uh, a diagonal covariance structure for the repeated uh, effects. If I want to uh, change this, I can. I can change this. Let's say I want to try out uh, an autoregressive structure, AR1. I can click on continue and then on OK. And you can see now what's listed is the autoregressive structure. And in this case, we've got uh, actually two, two parameters that are being estimated. One is the um, autoregressive, uh, autoregression uh, coefficient, and then also the variance are uh, for uh, for that as well and so you know basically when we look down here we've got the AR1 uh, diagonal and so essentially this is um, a variance estimate and we also have a variance estimate for the AR1 row uh, and then still we have the variance of the intercepts. Um, now in terms of you know making a judgment between the models we can also look at uh, you know making a comparison between um, we can look at the AIC and BIC for these two models and whichever one has the lower mo value might would, would be indicative of a better fitting model. So the first model we have uh, AIC is 11829 uh, uh, and the second model it's a little bit lower. This uh, first model the BIC uh, 11855 and then uh, for this one lower. So the AR1 model appears to do a little bit better job in terms of fitting um, the data than the first model. So we're going to stick with the AR1 um, autoregressive structure. We could check out different types of models as well if we wanted to, but um, in the interest of time I'm not going to go through all those. Um, so now I'll click on continue and let's say I want to model time as, um, as um, a predictor in order to model the growth curve. Uh, curves for the, uh, the students in the data set. So I'll move this over to the covariance box. Under fixed I'll move this variable over to the model box and uh, continue. 
uh, for the random. Now I have to make a decision as to how I want to treat the time variable. Um, if I want to leave it as uh, non-randomly varying across students, uh, in other words, what that would assume if I leave it as fixed and, and non-randomly non-random, then I'm essentially treating the growth curves as a, for the students as exhibiting variation, and it, basically the growth trajectories are, will all be equal across the students. So if I leave this alone right here, then I'm only, you know, I'm only sticking with the varying intercepts across the students. If I move this over, then I'm assuming that the slopes are randomly varying across the students. Um, again, just in the interest of time, I'll move this over to uh, uh, this box right here, and, and we'll, we'll at least uh, take a look at the question of whether there is significant variation in the slopes um, uh, for the growth curves across the uh, students. Um, I also, I'm going to go ahead and specify a diagonal matrix uh, to account for the uh, possible differences in the variances for the intercepts and uh, the uh, time uh, slopes uh, across the students. So I'm going to essentially allow for uh, the possibility that the variances of the intercepts and slopes across students uh, are unequal but still not postulate a correlation between um, those two, um, those two uh, parameters. So now when I click on OK, you can see that uh, in terms of the model dimension uh, table, um, now I have uh, you know, the fixed effect for the intercept across students and fixed effect for the time uh, variable. So that's uh, the average slope across the students. For the random effects, um, I'm essentially uh, modeled um, I have two uh, parameters that are being estimated, basically the variance of the intercepts and the variance of the slopes, so allowing those two parameters to vary across the students. Um, when we look at the uh, fixed effects, now we see uh, the relationship between time and uh, math grades, and you can see that we have a negative coefficient indicating that we have um, uh, a linear uh, decrease uh, of um, of about 3.275 units in terms of math grades for every one uh, increment or one unit increase in uh, time. The intercept, because time was coded with um, levels of 0, 1, and 2, the intercept is the predicted value on the dependent variable when, um, when your predictors are equal to 0. So this corresponds then to uh, time uh, 1 um, associated with uh, the math grade. So this is the average for time one, and then we see decreases on average of 3.275 units on math achievement for every increment in uh, time. When we look down here, we can see that uh, the variance of the intercepts, we see that the, you know that's the variance estimate. We see that there's significant variation uh, across the uh, um, students in terms of their uh, intercepts for their growth trajectories and we also see variation, significant variation in their slopes for the time uh, variable. So uh, at this point let's also try another uh, model. Let's in this case well, let's add in, we'll go back to linear and now what we'll do is we'll add in a time variant covariant. We'll use perceived math ability as a uh, potential covariant. Um, so in this case, we've added uh, math ability, um, and <clears throat> we'll add this as a fixed predictor as well. So this is also going to vary um, over time uh, with our, our time predictor. And so let's see, uh, so basically the idea is that um, as math ability changes um, over time, we would expect corresponding changes in math um, grades. Uh, but we're just going to leave the random slope for um, time alone. So in this particular uh, model right here, we you know notice that you know we're we're also seeing you know our you know some of these fit indices uh, decreasing. So it's actually kind of indicating that we've got increasing or better fit. Um, if we're using nested models, and um, some of these may be, we would probably be using a chi-square. Uh, difference test, but uh, really right now I'm just kind of focusing on the general process of model fitting. So you can see right here we've got um, we have uh, perceived math ability, um, and so we see that that is um, a significant positive predictor of math grades. So basically, 
um, um, when math ability uh, scores are higher, we also see higher levels uh, in terms of math grades. When math grades are lower, we would expect lower math grades. Time, we still see a significant uh, decrease over time in terms of um, um, math grades. So on average, we still see a decrease over time in terms of math grades, but we also s notice that, uh, that there's a, a positive predictive relationship between students' math ability uh, perceptions and uh, their math achievement. When we look down here, though, we see that the time variable in terms of the, the variance estimate it becomes non-significant. So in other words, um, you know, it may be that part of the variation um, in their, um, the, 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 the slope for the relationship between time and math uh, grades may, may be in part accounted for by uh, the math ability variable. So it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to keep that math, uh, that time variable as randomly varying um, uh, in this particular model as, it, as the uh, slope for time actually uh, drop to, to non-significance. So let's take that out and um, so we'll move this, we'll remove this um, here and then we'll move sex uh, over to the covariance box. So now we're going to just going to look at essentially we're going to be uh, testing whether um, the uh, the um, intercepts for uh, across the students, do they vary as a function of sex? So basically kind of a between student um, predictor of their um, kind of their their um, uh, math grades. So let's click. We'll click on fixed and move sex over uh, to this box right here. Click on continue and on OK. And so now you can see. Uh, by the way, it says uh, the covariance structure for the random effect with only one level will be changed to identity. And the reason why is pretty simple. It's because now when we um, uh, we essentially um, are now just estimating the variance of the intercept. So there's only one parameter being estimated. So the variance covariance matrix is essentially um, a scalar uh, matrix. So when we look, so there's nothing wrong here. It just kind of defaulted by taking care of that automatically for us. Um, so when we scroll down, you can see that in terms of the fixed effects, you can see that we still have a significant time uh, component. So basically, uh, you know, on average, we, we are uh, observing math grades decreasing uh, in students over time. That's a significant predictor. Perceived math ability is still a positive predictor of students' uh, math grades um, um, at, at, at the different time points. That's still statistically significant. And then sex, we have a negative coefficient. Um, and that's statistically significant. The negative coefficient is reflecting the fact that um, that basically um, that um, you know with the coding we had uh, females were coded zero and males were coded one, and so basically that just translates into um, the the fact that you know females uh, were scoring higher in terms of their math grades than than males. Um, you know, and the intercept uh, just kind of keeping in mind here. The intercept is a predicted value on uh, the dependent variable when your predictors are equal to zero. Um, so you know we're taking into account the fact that uh, time at time zero that is essentially time one. But uh, we haven't rescaled the math ability variable, and so that's why uh, we're essentially this is kind of like the um, the time one math grades adjusting for uh, the presence of the math ability. So that's why. Uh, this is kind of on the low side relative to um, to some of the previous analyses that we ran. So at any rate, looking at the um, estimates of covariance parameters, theoretically we could add in we have still statistically significant variation in the intercepts across students, and uh, there's a significance level, so we could theoretically add in additional uh, between student predictors um, of that uh, variation. Um, if we wanted to model a cross-level interaction, we certainly, I mean, not cross-level, yeah, we a uh, cross-level interaction, uh, we, we certainly uh, could. Uh, we, we can take, um, go to uh, continue, and uh, under fixed, let's just, uh, we're going to model, um, or actually uh, scratch the cross-level interaction, it just dawned on me that uh, because uh, 
time did not exhibit significant variation in terms of the slopes, um, there's no point in trying to model a cross-level interaction um, with sex. Uh, but had the slope for uh, our time variable uh, exhibit random variation across uh, significant uh, variation uh, across the students, and we might have uh, incorporated sex as a between subjects um, predictor of the variation of those slopes. So uh, we won't bother doing that in this particular video. So at any rate, uh, the whole point of this was just to kind of give you uh, a rundown of some of the options that are available to you when you are running um, a um, multi-level model um, using um, the uh, uh, linear mixed models uh, option in SPSS and you're working with repeated measures data. So obviously this is not exhaustive but there are lots of there are lots of different options that are available to you so uh, hopefully this serves a, at least as a useful um, uh, kind of overview of some of the the um, options that you have available.